So on today's show, I've got a special guest. His name is Zach the Russian. At least that's what he's called on on YouTube. Uh, and I want to uh, I want to welcome him. He's he's actually coming to us from Georgia. R Russian guy. Uh, let's let's talk to Zach a little bit. Ta Zach, tell me about yourself. Yeah. Hello, Chuck. Thank you for having uh, thank you for having me today. And hello, the viewers. Yeah, my name is Zach. Uh, my Russian name actually is Zahar. Uh, but it's kind of hard to pronounce for many of the not native speak, uh, Russian native speakers. So basically, I'm 21 years old Russian. I left Russia March 3rd after the 24th of February after Russia invaded Ukraine. I came to Georgia because this is the like one of the few options where you can go without a visa or big money and stuff. So um, I used to leave, I'm originally from the far east of Russia, the city called Komsomolsk on Amur. That's actually the city where they built those firefighters, Su-25, Su-27, 35. Yeah, and actually one of my stepdads uh, from my family, he was one of the like engineers of like uh, Su-35, like oh, wow. a long time ago. Yeah, so I got some connections to, <laughs> really tight connections to Russia. Uh, I was studying in Moscow, like my major was linguistics. Then I went to the US as an exchange student. I won a scholarship from Moscow embassy to go to the, oh, from American embassy in Moscow to go to the US for half a year. And then once I came back to Russia, I wanted to continue making videos about Russia in English. And here we go, the war started. I had to, I went to the protest 24th of February. At one point, like six policemen were chasing me. I got a whole video on my channel, like discussing all this. Uh, epopoeia and then I just left Russia in a week and uh, you know since recent uh, events I'm I'm so happy I left at, uh, at the right time. So let me ask you something uh, and this is something I think a lot of Westerners are wondering about uh, what is your when, when you're in Russia uh, obviously you knew about the invasion uh, the special military operation as they call it <laughs> um, you, you know you, you had access to that kind of information, but um, how much access did you have to, you know, sort of the non-propaganda, non-Russian state media information that would have told you, you know, about maybe some of the atrocities that were being committed in, in Ukraine or something like that? Mm -hmm. Do you mean the sources I was reading before 21st of February or after? Either. <clears throat> Well, uh, before the 21st of February, I was actually, I didn't believe that the war is going to happen, like the special military quotes operation. Uh, I didn't believe it at all. Like when I've been to the US, I remember I got a conversation with my American friend. He was like, Zach, all the American mass media is just uh, saying that there's going to be a war. Russia is preparing for a big war. And I said, Putin is just bluffing. And nobody among my friends, like nobody, they believed it's going to happen. Like up to the last uh, few days, up to like 22nd, 23rd of February, we didn't believe it. And even like after this uh, famous uh, speech of Putin on the 23rd of February, uh, we were thinking, okay, this is going to be a military operation running Russia. She participated, like Russia participated in the Donbass war before, but it was not official. So right now it's going to be just more official, but it's not going to be like conquering Ukraine. Like, key, like they were literally sending troops to Kiev in the first days of the war. So I was not expecting that. I was thinking it's going to be like maybe Donbass, Donetsk, Luhansk, those, ter those territories. But the first days, of course, I and like all of my friends freaked out. Um, so, yeah, basically I was like for speaking about the sources I was reading before. I usually use Telegram channels the Russian um, opposition creates, mm -hmm. like Alexei Navalny funds. Uh, there is uh, Maxim Katz funds and everything like they got, they are pretty good medias, but the, even they were not sure there's going to be a war. Nobody so like what, when, thought about it. So for example, uh, there was a lot of uh, news, uh, I'll say that maybe in quotes, uh, coming out of Russian state media that was saying that Ukraine, it was shelling Donetsk and Luhansk. Uh, that created sort of a, a, a rationale for for Putin to say we have to invade uh, to stop the Ukrainians from from bombing our people, except I was actually on the line of contact between Donetsk and Luhansk and Ukraine in those days, and that it was not happening. There was not shelling. I, we were watching 
on the, the Russian telegram channels where they were claiming that the Ukrainians were firing rockets and, and mortars and artillery at Donetsk and Luhansk. But I was with the soldiers that had the rockets and the mortars and they weren't being used. So, so we knew it was absolutely false, but I don't think most people in Russia or Armenia for that matter, I mean, lots of places that get Russian state media uh, could, could tell that it was just propaganda. Yeah, you know, speaking of just Russian people who are like not using the internet, and those are the people who are elder 40 years old, they are like the only source of information for them is TV. Like TV propaganda brainwashed many Russians, including many of my relatives. Uh, yeah, like most of my relatives, they lay up brainwashed. They lay up pro-Putinists. But actually, since recent events, they are starting to question like they love to Putin. So yeah, like I also remember this time, like before the 21st of February, when Russia started like to... Like when it was say they were saying Russia state propaganda was saying that yeah Ukrainians are bombing like Russia like Donetsk and Luhansk and like at the border with Russia, but I've heard that it was like there there was nothing. Maybe there was like a couple of the hits, but they were like really really questionable. Is this like really from Ukraine or from Russia? So right. for me it was actually obvious it is from Russia, and I was thinking okay they just need a um, like a cause to say yeah we're gonna like um, support Don Donetsk and Luhansk more but not like to invade the whole country. Uh -huh. so, so, so you made the decision to get out in March. Yep. Was it because you could see the writing on the wall and say they're going to do a mobilization and I'm going to get called into the military or was it for a different reason? Uh, basically, yes. I was afraid to get to fight against Ukrainians because, well, basically I was enrolled into the university. So it kind of keeps you away from mobilization, like potential mobilization. Not now, actually, but like way before. And I was thinking, okay, I had to go to the protest. I like, what's like, I cannot just sit at home and say nothing I, like uh, um, outside of it. So I went to the protest and after the protest on 31st of February, I've just realized that it's not possible to protest in Russia anymore. Like it was not really possible before, but after like after 21st of February is just so cruel. Like literally, are they not letting you even to gather around a square to protest? They just, it's like, it's, it's really cruel and just really hard. So I've just realized, okay, especially since I was making YouTube videos, how am I going to make YouTube videos about Russia in English, like showing how Moscow is beautiful or something while there is a war going on, while my country is destroying another country. So that's also what, what one was one of the part, one of the reasons I wanted to speak out against it but it's just not safe to do that in Russia. Uh, that's one of the reasons. And also, of course, I was enrolled into the university. And since I've been to the protest, uh, you know, they, th there is a practice on the protest that they track down where you are, like after the protest, from where did you came from with your phone, with your SIM card. And uh, they can track down by cameras because, you know, there are so many cameras in Moscow. It's one of the, like the, the biggest number of cameras in the whole cities in the world, I think. So it's really dangerous that they're going to come to your house and arrest you. So I was really, um, after this protest, I was really like paranoid. They're going to come over to my apartment and just arrest me. Like literally the next day after the protest, I was teaching a Russian lesson to my foreigner subscriber. And at one point I just heard like knock, knock on the door. And my, my roommate, he just came across like, Zach, this is for you. I was like, oh, what do I do? What do I do? I, I was like really lost. And I was like, okay, I'll just go to the bal like, balcony. Should I jump? of the balcony from the second floor maybe i was like oh like i just laid down on the balcony and i was like okay maybe if they enter the room it's going to be empty and they're going to be okay we just run let's go and at some point i just realized it's my fr it's another friend who just came so i was i was just paranoid just to say it quickly yeah, but you, so you just decided i don't want to live my life this way this is not a this is not a good way to live my life <laughs> yes and uh, secondly i don't want to be conscripted into russian military because if they like i was enrolled to the, into the university theoretically it kind of keeps you away from drafting but at the same time if you have been to the protest and your university gets to know about it and they get to know about it right away because police just say to the university this is a guy expel him that's it so if they expel me so I, ha I have to go to be drafted. And we know that conscripts were sent to Ukraine, not in a large scale, but still there were cases. And right now I think it's gonna be massive. Like conscripts gonna be sent to the care. So basically I was really afraid just to get uh, to the conscripted, drafted, 
and then sent to fight against Ukraine. And, and I'll, I'll tell you uh, what's what's really sad about that is that in the last couple of days, I've been watching videos of Russian mothers kissing their sons goodbye and, you know, in tears and stuff. That's always hard to see, especially as a yeah. as a father myself. And my I have a son that's in the U.S. Army. And I remember that day when we had to send him to Afghanistan. And, you know, I mean, it's that's that's hard anyway. But especially having been on the Ukrainian side of the war and, and it, reporting from there, yeah. having been out with the Ukrainian, uh, this this T-shirt was given to me a couple of weeks ago by the um, the the paratroopers, the Ukrainian paratroopers we oh, were wow. with, and they were telling me that they're guarding one side of a river and the Russians are on the other side of the river, and they said they said that the Russians are just sending so many men down to the riverbank to try to cross this river and we just kill them all and they're our enemy but we feel bad for these guys because they they have no chance but yet they'll send a hundred guys down we just machine gun them they all die they none of them survive and, a, and a, an hour later they'll send a hundred more and we'll kill all those guys and an hour later we we'll send a hundred more they said in the last three days we've killed 500 russians just on that riverbank and they said, they said, we're just, we're tired of killing Russians. I mean, we don't want them in our country, but we feel sorry for them because they're men just like us. We, you know, you, you want, if there's one thing, I was in the special operations in the military. Uh, I've been to combat quite a bit myself. And if there's one thing, um, I, I think that warriors, no matter what side they're on, have a certain kind of respect for one another, just because they know how miserable and how difficult and how dangerous being a, a, a soldier is. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, when I went to war here in Panama, I'm in Panama now, and uh, I was part of the invasion of Panama back in 1989, long before you were born. Um, mm -hmm. But I remember when we parachuted in here, I had no animosity towards the Panamanians. I had no hatred toward them. We were being sent to take down a dictator, to take their their leader out, but I didn't I didn't want to fight or kill any Panamanians, uh, you know. In the process, but of course, if they were shooting at me, uh, then I was going to do what I had to do, and, and I find it very annoying when people try to kill me because I'm a I'm a nice person, <laughs> you know. Why would anybody try to kill me? I'm a nice guy, um, but I didn't want to have to do that. And that's kind of how these Ukrainians feel. They There are some who are just, you know, they've seen their their buddies die and they're very angry and, and they're just like, we just need to kill all Russians. But I think part of the reason I think it's important to have uh, people like you on is to explain that these are just people like us, that the Russians by and large are just people like us. And it, even, it, even the ones who are supporting the war against Ukraine, are probably doing so out of a faulty sense of of what's what's going on because they're not getting all the information. You fortunately were able to get the you know more information than just what state media was giving you and that helped you make an informed decision.